Good morning, friends. Stephen Bernoon here with Israeli News Live, a production of the Noon Institute of Biblical Research, and it is a teaching message today, but we are going into the mark of the beast in a way you could never even possibly imagine. Um, I'm asking you, though, to very sincerely um, to listen carefully. Don't be quick just to turn off the video, anything like that, uh, but prayerfully consider the information you're going to hear. It is provocative. Uh, it will challenge everything that you've ever thought about when it comes to the mark of the beast. And I know with all the new things that have been going on for the last couple of years, there's been all kinds of ideas out there about the mark of the beast, etc. Um, but I want to remind you too. remember the scripture says in Revelation that it's not just uh, the mark, but you could have the name of the beast. You could have the number of his name. And then again, what is the beast? Who is the beast? There's so many things that need to be answered. And then, of course, you have the deadly wound. And that deadly wound is healed. Where does all this fit in Scripture? And if we can fit the pieces of the puzzle together, are we willing to really sincerely look at the evidence that is presented? I certainly hope that we're able to. And today I'm going to take you on a journey. And I have to thank Sister Jen, by the way, uh, sent me a message over on Facebook. And I hardly ever get a chance to look at all these messages. There's so many of them there, but it is what really caused me to look into this even deeper. So God bless you, my sister, for doing that. Uh, I want to start with Revelation chapter 13. And by the way, the 144,000, you're going to get the answer to that. Who are they? First fruits of God. That's another big mystery that people have poked around about for years and 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 I've wondered myself I've kind of stayed away from it to some degree because I want to know for sure before I speak about it um, because people hang on to every word you say and so I want to be as honest and forthright as I possibly can uh, so again as we get into this message please especially those of uh, uh, the Hebrew roots, the Messianic community, etc. Listen carefully to what I'm sharing with you and pay close attention, please, I ask you. All right, let's, we're going to be going back and forth, so let's get started. Revelation chapter 13, I'm going to start here with verse 10, may go up in a little bit here. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. He exercised all the power of the first beast before him, and caused, causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. And he does great wonders so that he makes fire come down from heaven on the, uh, on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. Saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. Boy, that's something that I meant to bring up a scripture on as well. So I've got to make sure we come by, back to that one in just a moment. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand and in their foreheads that no man might buy or sell save he that has the mark, 
or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Again, it's the, you can have a mark, you can have the name, or you can have the number of his name. Yeah. Here is wisdom. Let him that understands count the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man, and his number is 603 score and six. Now, if you'll notice, the number is not the mark. The number is the number of the beast itself. Now, that gives me a new way of thinking on things, right? Now, I want to go back, though, just for a moment. And let's go back to that one where I said I wanted to look that up for you. Verse 14. And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. Saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. All right, so the beast is wounded and he lives. And so everybody is looking for some kind of antichrist figure to rise up on the scene. He's going to have a deadly wound and he, and he, he and, the, and the wound is healed and he's still living. Well, we first need to identify prophetically this beast and that wound, etc. And, and then we can make more sense of it. So if you look in Genesis... We have written right here in chapter, uh, I think it's chapter 3 here. Yeah, chapter 3, verse 13. And the Lord God said unto the woman, because you got to remember, this is where the fall takes place, right? And the Lord God called unto the man and said to him, where are you? Okay, right here, starting here, verse 9. And he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree or whereof I commanded you that you should not eat? And the man said, the woman whom you gave me to be with me, she gave of, of the tree and I did eat. The Lord God said unto the woman, what is this that, thou, that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent beguiled me and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you from among all the cattle. Behema, by the way. you cursed from among all the beasts. Okay? Behema. Beast of the field. Upon your belly shall you go, and dust shall you eat all the days of your life. Now watch what he says next. And I will put enmity, which is hatred, between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. Now they put in there the word they, as I have it highlighted in like a, a kind of like a dark color there, a gray color. They shall bruise thy head. It doesn't say in Hebrew, they shall bruise thy head. Right there, there it is. Who? I put it in blue for you now so you can see that. Who? Who is he, not they, he. You cannot translate who as they. It's beyond me how ridiculous rabbis will do in order to be able to make it fit their own narrative, right? Who, Yashuf Rosh, he shall bruise your head. Wound, a deadly wound to the head. Of what? The serpent. So the serpent, the beast of Genesis, is going to get a deadly wound, but that wound is going to heal. Then it goes on and says, continues on, and you shall bruise their heel. Or um, literally, you could, that should, Ve'ata tushefenu akev. You shall bruise their heel. Now we know that the prophecy is speaking of Christ. And that Christ literally causes the deadly wound to what? The serpent, the beast. 
So when you're reading Revelation and we find out saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. Wow. The sword wounded the beast and he lives? You know, here's what's interesting. Let me let me pull over here. All right. Just take and type in the word sword. Let's go to the New Testament with the word sword. Okay, here we go. I, I didn't look it up yet. That's why I wanted to come to it. All right, here we go. Matthew 10, right there, by just by itself. Matthew 10, let's just look at that one there, right? Think not that I come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set a man at variance against his father and the daughter against her mother and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. So Jesus comes with a sword. Um... Uh, Let's see what else we have. Uh, hmm, one second here. The other one I'm looking for. Yeah, Hebrews, here we go. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even, uh, even to dividing asunder of the soul and spirit and of the joints and the marrow and a discern of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. And what did Jesus do when he came? When Jesus came, he wounded the beast itself, as we know from Matthew 23, right here. How does he wound that beast, that serpent of the Garden of Eden? When he reveals the ancestry of what happened there. When he says here in Matthew chapter 23, fill you then up the measure of your father's. You serpents, you generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them you shall kill and crucify. Some of them shall you scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city. Remember, Hebrew says the word of God is more powerful, more quick than any two-edged sword. The word of God came and wounded the beast. And that's what we had over here in Matthew 23. Jesus wounded. He bruised the head of the serpent. And the head was what? what? Why do we have the word head in there? Because the head represents the authority. Who was in authority in Israel at the time? Who was the the head of the, uh, uh, of the temple at that time, the high priest, etc.? It was the Pharisees. And Jesus wounded their head, exposing who they were, showing you that they were serpents, generation of vipers. If you look at the Hebrew Matthew, it's the genealogy, the descendants. Even as we read over in Genesis, you know, when he says in there, you know, that he would bruise his head and bruise his heel, right? But notice there, um, one of the other ones that we need to bring out as well. And that is, uh, okay. Yes. And, and to the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply. Well, no, 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 no. That's not the one either. Um, talking about where he puts the enmity between the seed is what I'm looking for there. Let's see. I thought I had it right there. And the Lord said in the serpent, because thou hast done this curse of, and, and from all the beasts of the field upon thy belly shall thou go to the dust of the earth. Yeah, here, that's right here. So, gosh, we're sitting right there at it, not even paying attention, okay? Ve'eva ishita benecha uvein isha 
אוקיי? ובין זרעך ובין זרע. Right? I will put the hatred between your seed and the woman's seed there. The children. And that hatred, because we know from the fallen angels, the fallen angels in Genesis chapter 6 cohabitated with mankind and brought in a beast kingdom upon the earth. And we find that being fulfilled because Jesus wounds the head of the beast. He wounds that head of that beast. The image of the beast is wounded, but now it's revived. What do, what do I say when I, when I say it's revived, right? All right, let me give you an example of that re reviving, right? Um, Israel. Was it Hagee? I, I don't know how you spell Hagee's name, John Hagee. Um, I got it all mixed up here. Let's see. There we go. John Hagee. All right. Good example right there. Must never allow Iran to get a nuclear bomb, okay? whatever the case may be. The wound that was given by Jesus himself that exposed, that, that identified the Pharisees of 2,000 years ago as being the, the beast that that system is. Now, that doesn't mean that all Jews are of a Pharisaic bloodline or a serpent reptilian bloodline, but intermixed in the modern state of Israel is clearly a reptilian bloodline. And Jesus exposed the Pharisees for that. But what's odd is that you have people like Hagee, you have people like uh, uh, Yitzhak uh, Shapira, uh, you know, that, uh, let's see here. All right, you have, you have guys like, Right, like Shapira here, that also are very much. Yeah, get the right one here so we can get an image there. You know, you get you get guys like it's like Shapira that are out there. Hey, all of them bringing you back underneath Talmudic rabbis, and Shapira. Let me just see if we can. Let me see if I can pull this out for that. Uh, Yitzhak Shapira literally has taught that you need to go underneath the Talmudic rabbis of Israel. That when the Messiah comes, he will straighten everything out. But until then, you're to go up underneath these rabbis. The deadly wound is healed. Jesus came and exposed who the Pharisees were. And now, uh, let me see if I can pull this out here. Let's see. Pharisees uh, today. One, one of the best ones that can teach on that uh, is actually a Karite Jew. Uh, Nehemiah Gordon. Okay. Let me see if I can see if Nehemiah Gordon comes up. Let's see. Nehemiah is... I'm probably spelling everything wrong. Here we go, right here. Uh, Nehemiah Gordon definitely, accurately has taught that the Pharisees of 2,000 years ago are the Jewish people, are, are, the, are, are, are the Orthodox community of today. So, now he's, he's completely, you know, Nehemiah is completely Jewish. He's not... He's not there to say that he is a believer of Yeshua or anything like that. All right. I have respect for that. But he's a Karite Jew. He believes in only the Old Testament. He does not believe in Talmudic teachings, although he does come from a uh, Talmudic background. But I'm fascinated because we see that deadly wound is healed in so many 
This, this is the danger that people don't realize that when you're building up a modern state of Israel, not realizing that scripture has been fulfilled, you're contributing to that. You're contributing to the reviving of a beast system. You know, if it was just the Jewish people wanting to be in their homeland, that'd be one thing. But when you're literally contributing to a Pharisaic dominated reign, what a mess. What a mess. All right. So, so anyway, so we first have to establish that this mark of this beast, who the beast is, the beast is clearly identified in scripture that there would be a deadly wound. That wound would be healed. And of course, Genesis is where we find out the prophecy of the beast, which would be the serpent, that he would get that deadly wound. And Revelation tells you that that wound is going to be healed. And not only that it's going to be healed, and he, got the, and he gets the wound by what? A sword. And the sword is the word of God, which is more powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword that divides asunder and pierces even the bone and the marrow, right? That's what it says in Hebrews 4. 4.12. Let's just pull it up on the screen there. Let's take, let's take a look at Hebrews 4.12. Uh, I'm blown away by all of this, right? I'm really, and, and like I said, I'm about to show you some things. And, and this is not easy to take, friends. I know it's not. Um, so bear with me. Right? There's your sword. The word of God, more powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing, even dividing us under soul and spirit of the joints and marrow, the cern of the thoughts and intents of the heart. What did Jesus do? He knew their thoughts. He perceived, as the scripture said, what they were, what they would think, what they would do. He knew which ones were of that serpent reptilian kingdom, the beast. Now there is any, any creature that is not manifest in his sight. But all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Look at that. Look at that right there. There is... Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. So there's the sword. There's the word of God that gave that deadly wound to the beast when he was here. We identified that that wound is done, right? But, but now we find in Revelation that, 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 the, that, that they're going to make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. Then watch what it says. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast and that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. That's coming. The Noahide laws do exactly that. They'll put you to death. Didn't know that, huh? Hmm. And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. Now, let me just show you something on this Noahide laws, right? Noahide laws. Death. I didn't even think to put it up yet, right? So I apologize for that. I, let me let me just see if we let's let's see if we can do videos on this. Maybe we'll pull, come up with something that Yana taught on that, uh, because she she was the main source of that information initially. Um, yeah, of course she debated uh, Dr. Brown on that, and and he just could not withstand the debate. Uh, let me let me let me take you over to YouTube. I'll I'll, I'll take you right to where it's at there. Because Yana just really, 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 really 
did an amazing job on these on this subject here let's see here here we go exposing the noahide laws if you go to israeli news live and you go to that list right there uh this is where yana really brings all those things out in multiple you have multiple videos on this beware of noahide laws even yana chat beware of leaven of the pharisees etc 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 all the way down but it is a death sentence to break a Noahide law. And that's what they're going to put the world under, the Noahide laws. All right? So keep those things in mind. Now, all right, so we got that. We've already done Matthew 23. This is where Jesus is exposing. And again, the head, the head, of course, being the, the leaders of Israel is where you got that representation. All right? And then what's interesting is that we talk about the mark being in the hand and in the head. Now, this is where you've got to really begin to think. Only one place scripturally do we see anything that is marked on the hand or the head. Now, initially, it was never intent to be a bad thing. Because in Exodus, there is a memorial that is given to the children of Israel when they come out of the land of Egypt. And that is okay for a season. And a, a sign shall be for a sign unto thee upon thy hand and for a memorial between thine eyes and the law of the Lord may be in thy mouth for with a strong hand that the Lord brought thee out of Egypt. Now we're, we're talking about the Teflim, right? And this was a custom for the Israelites. And at that time, perfectly okay. But if you notice, like in this picture here, you have a priest wearing a phylactery on his forehead. And, and by the way, this is what they have in these cube boxes uh, there was nothing like that of what was actually worn 2,000 years ago when Jesus was here. There was no cubes. So even the tradition of what they're doing now is not what it was then. But what I find interesting, though, right, is that anybody and everybody is starting to wear it now. Women are wearing them, which in Jewish custom is totally forbidden, right? You have the article here, Women on of the Wall of Dome Teflin in TLV. Not only that, you even have the uh, transsexual female Jews make video teaching how to literally best wear phylacteries. You have it in the Messianic community, Hebrew roots community, everybody's doing it. See, but it's on the forehead, it's on the hand. Now, it's not that the phylacteries itself is a mark, it's the fact that you're going back to the law itself. That's what marks you. That's why you don't just have to have something on your hand or on your forehead. You can literally have the name of the beast or the number of his name. So think about that. All right. You have. Um, so I want to I want to share with you some of these things. And like I said, it doesn't matter if you're Christian or not. Everybody's doing it. See, in the case of John Hagee or, or, or Yitzhak Shapiro, which I'm sure Yitzhak Shapiro wears the Teflon as well, there, that's taking you back to the law. All right, we're gonna, I'm going to explain it. So, like I said, it's going to challenge you. Think deeply. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thy hand, and they shall be for frontless between thine eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the doorpost on thy house and upon thy gates. This was as a memorial to the law itself that God had given Moses when they come out of the wilderness journey, and it's basically it's the Ten Commandments. All right, and the name of the Lord shall, uh, of the Lord be kindled against you, and He shut up the heaven so that there shall be no rain, and the ground shall not yield her fruit, and you shall perish quickly from off the good land which the Lord. Lord giveth you. Therefore shall you lay up these words in your heart and in your soul, and you shall bind them for a sign upon your hand, 
and they shall be frontless between your eyes. And you shall teach them to your children, talking with them, talking, oh, excuse me, of them, when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. And you shall write them upon the doorposts, and on the house, and upon your gates. Again, in the time of Israel, all the way up to the time of the coming of Christ, perfectly fine. Nothing wrong with that. All right? That's what you got to understand. That was perfectly fine. But now watch what happens. Let's go to Revelation 14. We got to get back to the mark. Because you got to remember, Jesus wounded. He is that sword. He wounded the head of the beast, the Pharisees. And that deadly wound has been since healed. Now we go into Revelation chapter 14. These are they which are, this is, and I looked and behold, a loyal lamb stood on Mount Zion with him and 144,000, and his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, from heaven as the voice of many waters and the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps, and they sung as it were a new song to the throne. Uh, before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goes. These are were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. Well, we know the Lamb is Jesus Christ, and they are the first fruits. They were the first believers of Jesus. And in their mouth was found no guile, and they are without fault before the throne of God. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. Saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and who shall and, and, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of the waters. Now, that 144,000, as we know, are made up of the 12 tribes of Israel, right? Now, before I go further, because we're going to go back to the mark of the beast still yet. Acts chapter 2. Okay, Acts chapter 2. Verse 36, therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. The house of Israel? Everybody is looking for the lost tribes of Israel to come back home in this modern days that we're living in now because we got to fulfill the scripture, you know, because when Jesus came, he came to his, he came to the house of Judah. The house of Judah believed him. We had the 120 in the upper room. And after the 120 in the upper room, then the gospel spread through all the world, but the 12 tribes were still lost. Well, no, they were not. Because we also find out that when the 120 came out, which fulfilled the scripture that the foot, uh, the, the, okay, how's the scripture? Uh, I'm going to have to paraphrase this here. That the, that the uh, um, let's see. Ephraim would not lift up his foot against uh, 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 Judah. I believe something to that effect there is where the prophecy is. In other words, he would save the house of Judah first, then he saves the house of Israel. That all happened on the day of Pentecost. On the day of Pentecost, the 120 in the upper room were representations of the house of Judah, and they received the Holy Spirit first. Then the scripture says, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues. And the Spirit gave them utterance and there were dwelling in Jerusalem Judeans, not Jews, Judeans, devout men of every nation under heaven. Now, when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed. And marvel, saying, one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Now, even though they're Judeans, not Jews, Judeans, they were not born in Israel. They were born in Perithias, Medes, Elamites, Mesopotamia, Asia, Judea. Some were born in, in, in Israel. Egypt, even, Cyrene, Rome. And they were Judeans and proselytes. 
they were mixed. Cretes, Arabians. We do hear speak in, in our tongues the wonderful works of God. Well, then who were these Judeans? If they're Judeans, that means they are from, they were, their ancestors were from Israel initially. Well, Peter later tells you who they were. Right? When he gets down to verse 36, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that, that, God, that, that God hath made that same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. The twelve tribes were all together. That's why when you read as, uh, what is it, Zechariah, I believe, uh, you know, they take the hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew. That Jew, that singular Jew, is Jesus Christ. And we hear that God is with you in the plural is the 12 tribes of Israel. Or in this case here, that literally was the 120 in the upper room. Zechariah was being fulfilled also in Acts chapter 2. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gifts of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children, to all that are far off, as many as the Lord our God shall call. And as and with many words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they gladly received his word and were baptized the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Well, somewhere along the way, when the, all the gospel was first spreading there in Israel, in Jerusalem, they managed to get, without a question in my mind, 144,000, 12,000 from each tribe. And if you'll always notice, when it comes to the Jewish people, there are always specific numbers. There's 120 in the upper room. There's 3,000 souls added, 144,000 in the book of Revelation. It is what the first fruits unto God. First fruits were 2,000 years ago, friends, not 2,000 years later. We definitely are not the first fruits. We would be the last ones to come in. All right, so we got to look at this scripturally the right way. Now, as we look at that fulfillment, now let's go back and let's continue on in Revelation chapter 14. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. In their mouth was found no guile. And I, in verse 6, and I, and I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and every nation and every kindred and tongue and people. And that's exactly what happens after the house of Judah come in. Then came in the house of Israel. Now the gospel could go to the Gentiles. It wasn't supposed to be the other way around. Saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him. The hour of his judgment has come and worship him that has made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of the water. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. That's Israel. That's the modern state of Israel. And it doesn't mean that she's fallen as far as no longer a state. But the fall, notice, because the 144,000 shows the pure gospel going forth with 12 tribes represented taking the pure gospel of the whole world. Now we're finding out that Babylon has fallen. Why do they call it Babylon? As I brought out the other day, if you look at the book of Ezra, chapter 9, the priest and the Levites, they mingled, the people mingled this, the holy seed with the peoples of the lands, the Hittites, the Perzites, the Jebusites, and the Canaanites, which were Nephilim, which were reptilian bloodlines. Where did that happen? When Israel was in captivity in Babylon. Actually, the house of Judah was in captivity in Babylon. And Judah was actually the head because Judah had not fallen like the house of Israel. The house of Israel had done the exact same thing too. They had also mingled in amongst the Nephilim bloodlines. That's what caused them to be dispersed throughout all the world. But when Jesus came, Jesus first with as the sword that is more powerful than sharper than any two-edged sword, the word of God being, he discerned the thoughts and intents of the heart and revealed to you who the reptilian was that was intermingled among the Jewish people of his day. 
He called to himself his own. He separated the ones that were not. And he revealed to you that they were what? Serpents. Vipers. He wounded the head of that serpent. He fulfilled the prophecy of Genesis. And then he brought out that first fruit. And that first fruit, beautiful fruit, that went to all the world and the gospel went forth. But now we've come back and what? Babylon has fallen. What is Babylon? That's the modern state of Israel where they brought in again a Pharisaic kingdom. Why? The deadly wound is healed. Now they're rising up. Babylon has fallen, has fallen the great city because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. What was her fornication? As we mentioned, Ezra, right? Sorry, let me pull that up for you. I, I, I'm going to just pull it up because you need to see it. And, and friends, I know many of you, you guys have watched this like Steve. Oh gosh, we already know this. We already know this. There's people every day, hundreds that come on board that don't know it. Okay, that's the only reason I have to keep bringing it back out. Ezra chapter 9. For they have taken of their daughters for themselves and for their sons so that the holy seed have mingled themselves with the peoples of the lands. And the princes and the rulers have been first in this faithful, faithlessness. Where did this happen at? Babylon. That's why it says Babylon, Babylon, the great has fallen, has fallen. All right, so now. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and the presence of the Lamb. If you receive the mark. And again, you're getting that mark in the forehead or in, in the hand. The mark of the beast. The beast is that bringing that law back, putting the people back under bondage. <clears throat> let's look at this then, right? Let's look. Let's let's jump over here to Hebrews, for example. Hebrews chapter ten. But this man, after he had offered uh, one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God, from henceforth expecting to let his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. For after that he, he had said before, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. So then why would you want to go back to the law? All right, not only that, watch what James says. If you fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, you do well. But if you have respect to persons, you commit sin and are convinced of the law as a transgressor. If you have respect to persons. In other words, you, you esteem this, the modern state of Israel and the Jewish people of today. You esteem that. You're having respect to persons. You commit sin. Notice what he says. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. For he that said, do not commit adultery, said also, do not kill. Now, if you com if you now if you commit no adultery, yet you kill, you are become a transgressor of the law. So speak uh, you and do so, and that you shall be judged by the law of liberty. For he shall have judgment without mercy that hath showed no mercy, and mercy rejoice rejoices against judgment. So. <laughs> you know what, what was the scripture I forget where it was at there where it says you know that under under the law of Moses there there was you know if you transgress there was no mercy period 
That's why when it says you take on that mark of the beast, all that scripture was showing you when it gives you that sign, the mark in the hand and in the forehead, or the number of the name of the beast, or the or even the name of the beast himself, it doesn't matter which one you take, you're embracing back that law and there's no mercy for you. You count the blood of Jesus Christ an unclean thing. You count the very redemptive work of Christ as if it didn't matter. And then that fiery indignation that's coming upon the earth in the not so distant future. Oh my gosh. I mean, do you not realize, friends, listen, go back to what, remember, when God gave that commandment over here in Deuteronomy for them to, as a reminder to where to bind them a sign upon their hand and upon and, and the front and between their eyes, that was acceptable for them. There was nothing wrong with that. They had just come through the, the most horrendous judgments on the earth you could possibly imagine. And we're about to see the same type of judgment. I mean, look at Malachi. Look at Malachi uh, chapter 4 in English. Uh, well, let me, I'm going to do it from English instead of Hebrew for you, okay? Because you really need to see that in, 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 the, in, the, uh, in the English version is what you need to see. Because in Hebrew, it's only chapter 3. But to separate... Behold, the day comes, comes that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, all that do wickedly shall be stubble, and the day that comes shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, and it shall leave them neither root nor branch. And by the way, that root is there, is Satan himself. His tree is going to be destroyed. But unto you that fear my name shall the son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and you shall go forth and grow up his calves as a stall. I can't help but think that this is that system, that binary system that's coming through, because it will bring judgment upon this earth like you've never seen before. And you will go and tread under, you know, the, 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 the wicked will become ashes under the soles of your feet. Now, we're, friends, I'm telling you, we're in a very serious hour right now. Um, another one here I wanted to bring up to you as well. Oh, no, this is actually for a different time. I'll come back to that different time there. Like I said, that mark of the beast let's go back to revelation over here because i knew that there was something i probably wanted to go even earlier on in this here yeah so he saw the beast rise up out of the sea having seven heads ten horns and upon his horns ten crowns and upon his heads the name of blasphemy and the beast which i saw was likened to a leopard his feet were as the feet of a bear the mouth of the mouth of the lion the dragon gave him his power his seat his great authority and i saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death and his deadly wound was healed and the and all the world wondered after the beast. And that's what's amazing to me to this day. The whole world is being enthralled, just, just enthralled. It doesn't matter who it is. I mean, we can be at war right now. Putin can be over there fighting against Ukraine and, 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 and say that he's fighting against the globalist New World Order, which I don't buy it because he's in bed with Chabad like no big deal. Can't wait for the third temple to be built. You know, the nations all over the world, with the exception of a few like maybe Iran, but even Iran, even Iran, Iran knows that they're going to attack Israel because it's part of the globalist plan. But that mark of the beast sitting right there in front of us. Now, by the way, I'm not saying, so you do understand this in closing, I'm not saying that the Teflin is the mark. It is, it is the, the, what I'm trying to get you to understand. It's going back, it's symbolic. The mark is symbolic. All right, that's what I'm trying to get you to understand. It's symbolic. And in this case here, all these different ones, it doesn't matter. Women, men, doesn't matter. You know, they wear it. It's the, it's the embracing the beast kingdom once again, which is the law that you've been delivered out from 
by the blood of Christ. Okay, and in that new, in, when they bring that law back, they'll be able to put you to death because they're going to bring the Noahide laws in for the Gentiles. Gentiles, you'll be under Noahide laws, and you can be put to death for what you embrace that or what you offend in those Noahide laws. All right, and I just find it interesting, though, that here we are in the modern days and everything, and it just so happens to be that it doesn't matter if you're Christian, if you're women, or even if you're, as it shows in that one clip there, uh, transsexual. Everybody's wearing the Teflon now. Those things are just signs for us to know. It was to give you something so that you would have an idea who and what the beast kingdom actually is. And this is not Jewish people. Don't confuse the two. All right? But amongst the modern state of Israel and this elite group, there is rising the serpent kingdom again. The beast kingdom is rising up and is going to dominate this reptilian agenda. Satan himself, the fallen angels, are using that particular place on earth in the Middle East there to raise up. And the whole world is wandering after the beast. That's what amazes me. Everybody is in th just, in, oh, wow. Israel, 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 Israel. Do you not know that the scripture says, in closing, let me just remind you, right? Come out of her. Right? Where is it at here? There we go. Revelation 18.4. So let's just take us over to Revelation 18.4. Because... God wants you to come out of it, right? And here it is again. And he cried with a mighty, with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great has fallen, has fallen, and become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornications with her, and merchants of the earth have, are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, that you receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached into heaven, and God hath remembered her anew. That message is to both Jews and Gentiles alike because there are good Jewish people that are caught up into this as well. There are good Christians and Gentiles that are caught up. In it. You don't have to be a Christian. you just just caught up into worshiping the beast. And you haven't recognized that Jesus Christ wounded the head of the serpent he fulfilled it 2,000 years ago. That deadly wound is healed and the whole world is mesmerized. Friends, not many people are willing to tell you the truth. And if you appreciate that, that we we're willing to tell you the truth and you want to stand and support the work that we're doing, please do so because believe me, not many people will and not many people will support truth. They'll do the itching ears. They'll tickle your ears all day long, but they won't tell you the truth. We appreciate your support. Our website is RayleighNewsLive.org. Uh, you can click right there online. Easiest way to donate, just clicking online. I'll put a link in the description below. Or by mail, Danoon Institute, or under my name, Stephen Benoon. And by the way, the Danoon and Benoon are not the same names. They're similar. One is a Hebrew version. The other is a French version of the name. Uh, still still my name. Either way, it doesn't matter which way you use it. But Benoon is my legal name, Stephen Benoon. At, um, uh, but Danoon Institute is the name of our ministry itself, the French version of our name. 
uh, P.O. Box 156, Sunbright, Tennessee, 37872. By the way, we just uh, sent out uh, mail yesterday to thank those of you that have been so kind to help us. Uh, as I have been saying recently, the need uh, that we're going through right now is tremendous. I won't go into the details. I'm not permitted as of yet. I have been given a timeline, though, when that can be shared. So that timeline is coming up soon where we can express to you what's going on. Uh, but there is tremendous costs that we're incurring right now. And your help and love is very much needed. Thank you and God bless you. And have a great day.